and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to our closing Masterful Masterclass of the 2017 TIFF Industry Conference. I'm Karina Rotenstein, your conference programmer. In six days, we've delivered nearly 50 hours of programming featuring over 160 inspiring guests. I would like to acknowledge the hardworking TIFF teams, the CBC production teams and tech teams, to all the ushers, volunteers, for all their warmth and generous spirit in putting together such a great show. It's been an honor and a prov privilege to work with you. Please give them a hand. This afternoon's masterclass is supported by Pinewood Toronto's studio, uh, which makes for a great fit for, this, for today's session. I Shot Andy Warhol was the first R-rated film that I snuck, ever snuck into. I was 14, and six of my friends and I we were all aspiring actors and directors. We skipped theater school and commuted two hours into downtown Toronto. And that bold, and feature, de that, that bold feature debut film introduced us into the to the fringe story of Valerie Solanus and left a profound impression showing us everything that was possible for a young budding filmmaker in Toronto. Director, writer in film and television and former music journalist, Mary Heron has always had her finger on the pulse in actively seeking stories of bold, unapologetic, real life and fictional characters. Her feature film debut, I Shot Andy Warhol, announced her as an important voice in cinema controversially followed by American Psycho, The Notorious Betty Page, and The Moth Diaries. She directed episodes in notable television series, including Homicide, Life on the Streets, Oz, The L Word, Six Feet Under, Big Love, and The Anna Nicole Story. Mary Heron returns to TIFF with the world premiere of the television series, Alias Grace, an adaptation of Margaret Atwood's Giller, winning, Giller Prize winning novel and created by Sarah Pauly. Uh, the, films, the show screens tomorrow, Thursday, 8.30 p.m. at the Winter Garden Theatre. Hosting today's masterclass is a fellow Canadian luminary, Canadian luminary, having also garnered international recognition for her work. Patricia Razuma is part of the, a the 80s Toronto New Wave, the lone filmmaker, filmmaker of the bunch. Award-winning director, writer, producer, has charted a noteworth noteworthy career of films, including her debut, I've Heard the Mermaid Singing, so the film premiered at the director's fortnight in Cannes, where it won the Prix de la Jeunesse and opened the Toronto International Film Fe Festival in 1987. Her other work includes When Night is Falling, Mansfield Park, co-writing HBO's Grey Gardens with Drew Barrymore and Jessica Lange, Yo-Yo Ma's Six Gestures, and Into the Forest. She was recently invited to become the member of the Ac uh, Academy of Motion Pictures of Arts and Sciences. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage Patricia Razuma and Mary Heron. <laughs> so you grew up in Canada. First 12 years, am I right? Yeah, well, some of that, because my dad um, was a performer, some of that was also in New York and uh, California. So I moved around a lot as a child and all my life, really. Yeah. What does, what, what does it do to your filmmaking? Well, what? I, th I think being Canadian has a very interesting perspective because it's a, it's a North American culture, but you're not American. Even as a child, I remember knowing that that we weren't the, the center of the world, and that action was a lot of action was taking place elsewhere, and a lot of bad things were taking place elsewhere. Uh, so I was proud of being Canadian, but I also had, you know, when I lived in America as a child, I was like, I'm Canadian. They don't even know what Canada is. <laughs> and I, but I think even now, although I've lived in, in New York for many years, and I think of myself as a New Yorker more than someone who lives in America, because New York's its own world, but. I think knowing that you're not the center of the universe affects all of us, me still, and I, I can see that difference between me and American filmmakers. Uh, what does it, how does it affect what's on screen? Um, I, I mean, I'm accused of, being, of having a distance in things. You, uh, from the material? Yeah, well, that it's, it's uh, cool in some ways, although I, don't, I feel emotionally about what I do. But I think that you have maybe a... a I mean, you compare me sort of like to, to Oliver Stone or Scorsese, you know, a visceral American filmmaker like 
which tend to be men as well, you know, masculine visceral filmmaking. And I think there's maybe more a critique or a, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel definitely, um, even though I'm a very different, I'm a huge Cronenberg fan, I, I feel a lot of um, sort of empathy with Canadian filmmakers and the way they look at the world, you know? Uh, I, so I'm just very conscious that I'm, I, I know I'm not the representative of the most powerful nation on earth. <laughs> and that has a lot of advantages. And also as a woman, I'm definitely not the most powerful person on earth. And, and I think all that goes together as somewhat of an outsider perspective. Um, so, some say, um, well, actually, William Trevor once said <laughs> that in early life, you have a primal scene, something that happens to you maybe 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, and that you spend the rest of your artistic life kind of trying to unpack that. Is this too personal a question? Oh, of, of things that have happened to you? <laughs> Some that, something that happened to you in that early time that you feel like somehow you're just trying to address that for the rest of your life. I don't know if I'm trying to address it, but at the age of 12, I was uprooted uh, at a time when I was living in Toronto and, and a young, you know, very engaged in my friendships and my world. And I was moved, removed um, uh, by my, uh, my stepfather was a novelist. He'd written this book in praise of older women that had been a big success. And so he was Hungarian, wanted to get back to Europe. So we all moved to Italy for a year. And I thought we were coming back to Canada and, my, and the teenage life I would have had. And it's funny, every time I come back to Toronto, I feel like there was a parallel life for me that in some ways would have been a more normal life where I would have had a teenager and kept my dear, these close friends and had a progression of my teenage life. Instead, I was transplanted first to Italy, which is a great experience. I didn't go to school for a year, but that was great in many ways. <laughs> I saw a lot of art, art galleries and read some books. And, um, and then I went to England, and I was transplanted at the age of 13 into London, into living off the King's Road, sort of swinging 60s London, which is kind of great in many ways. But suddenly into a British school where I, I was totally an outsider, and I didn't really have friends for a year. And, and I think that that experience of being transplanted and of having life disrupted, which was in many ways good for me, but also gave me a real jolt of perspective where suddenly I was looking at everything. I was the outsider. People made fun of my accent. And, and I suddenly had to see my world in their eyes. And I think I've never lost that. So I'm also sort of a stateless person. Um, although I, you know, feel my Canadian identity and I, all my family's in Canadian, all my relatives, uh, it, it gave me a certain outsider quality. And I, and I think all my films are about outsiders. Even though, you know, I'm quite a happy person, really. I mean, <laughs> it's not like, mm, poor Mary. Um, but actually, but I just have, I, I really identify with them very strongly. You feel like you're giving outsiders a voice? I, I, I never make um, a conscious decision on any kind of material. I, you I, never I, make a conscious no, decision? No, I mean, what I mean is my, I read something and it's, it affects me, speaks to me. I can sort of relate to it, but that's not an intellectual decision. And I, I respond to it, and then I decide whether or not to do it. So obviously the, there is a conscious decision because <laughs> it's not, but, but it comes after the... Right, it, it strikes you and, or it doesn't end. And I always said, I will only make films about outsiders because the films I've made, the people I've made films about are very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, but I, when I look back, including Grace Marks, you know, of Alias Grace, they are all outsiders in some way. Mm -hmm. um, you, I read, when I was sort of um, reading up about you, you said something about I'm not trying to make the world a better place. And I'm sorry to quote things back at you because it's sometimes you're never allowed to change because <laughs> you just have to kind of, rip, because people repeat things to you. But would you still stand by that? You're not trying well, to make the world a better place? What I said, it was a bit careless the way I said it because I guess, you know, I guess we're all trying to make the world a better place. And I think if you make a good film, then the world's a better place, you know? Hmm. Um, what I was trying to say was, I, I was thinking about a conversation I had with a Hollywood executive um, when I was when we were pitching American Psycho, and someone said to me, you know, well, will, will people go, come out of this film thinking the world is a better place than before they saw it? And I thought, God, no, I hope not. You know, <laughs> no, of course they won't. You know, 
right. So if it's a good movie, then yeah. they'll have that a good yeah. experience. So I was trying to say that, that, and, and be, I, I think that was also in the context of are you a feminist filmmaker, which I would always say, of course, you know, who, is, who could not be a feminist if you're a, a woman filmmaker? But I'm not ideological. Many, many would say they weren't yeah. up until recently. Yeah, yeah, but I would never, have, I would never uh, turn my back on that. But on that, I'm not, I hope, I think what I mean is I'm not a moralizing. You're I, not a, I'm sorry? I'm, I'm not a, a, moral, a moralizing. Right. Um, I, 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 I'm really interested in everything and exploring all the characters and, and, and loving them all, you know, even the bad ones. The reason I ask is I, was, I recently saw a panel and it was uh, a kind of a white privileged woman and a Chinese immigrant and a First Nations indigenous woman and they were all talking they were asked that question what, do, you, do you want to change the world and the white woman said no and the other two said absolutely mm. <laughs> and I thought of course if you're if you're yeah. winning in that game you, you, you don't want to change things um, can you I mean, respond to that? Well, I think you can change the world without being uh, moralizing about it. Um, I think all your your responsibility is to be as truthful as you can to what you're interested in. You know, and if 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 you're making a film about a privileged world, you know, so be it. That's that's what you have to talk about. Fine. Um, I. You know, I've had films about privileged people, you know, American Psycho, and I've had films about, you know, Valerie, you know, my first film, about Valerie Salatis, who was a totally, total outsider, um, the most marginal and, and underprivileged person, in a way, in the Warhol circle. But I, I all that I felt in terms of a, of a political ambition, and I don't even know if I would call it political, but I felt... What if, this was the, the impetus behind making that film, I was, I was doing a, long story, I was doing a, a, working as the researcher in television, in documentaries, and I was researching a big documentary about Warhol, and I knew, I knew all about everybody in the Warhol world, and then I found Valerie Solanas' Scum Manifesto, and said, I thought this was just a crazy person, this woman's a genius, if crazy also at the end. What if the most marginal and ignored person in a story is the most interesting person? Um, what does that mean? That means like you, a homeless person you pass in the street, and I often think about this, they may be the most interesting person there, and the most talented, the most brilliant. So, you know, in that sense, there was a feeling I had about, you know, stories that were not told. You know, angles on, on history. Um, you know, uh, which was very true, obviously, for women, and it's even more true for if you were First Nations. You know, the more marginal you are, the more your story isn't mm. told. Right. Um, you seem to know in that film. You seem to know that world so well. It really feels like it, it's it's very hard to go to a scene like that um, and portray it without feel, looking kind of awkward and wooden. But the way you portrayed it was really remarkable. I admired it so much. So. Did you, were you in a like scene? Well, in I was, I was part of, um, I was part of the, uh, you know, New York punk rock, CBGB's sort of New York underground, which I always felt was the child, was a direct kind of outgrowing of it, and, and, and very much uh, f had the Velvet Underground as its kind of, uh, you know, flagship. gods and <laughs> flagship. And, um, and I think the first time I went to CBGB is when there was just like 20 people there, but one of them was Lou Reed, and, and I think Warhol had been in. And so, you know, you really felt like touched by that world. I had met Warhol, I met Warhol in the mid-70s. He was a, a different world than the 60s factory. But I, I felt in touch with a certain kind of New York underground and, uh, and a certain kind of in, in, in rock world, certain ways of people just hanging out. I certainly knew people, who, you know, who took drugs and hung, hung out. You know, I, I, I'd been around a certain number, amount of people. And then I watched a ton of Warhol films. When I was at college and I was do doing student journalism, I did a big essay on Warhol, and one summer I watched all his movies at a theater on, um, in Notting Hill Gate in London. And so I had immersed myself 
Because that's the thing, Warhol made fantastic, I love his films actually, and, and I would just sit for hours in fi Warhol films when <laughs> nothing much is happening, but to me it's like so interesting. So it was a lot of immersion, and I'd met a lot of them, and I'd, I'd interviewed a lot of them. So did you, just some kind of technical uh, questions, like what did it cost, how long did you take to shoot, um, did you rehearse? I shot Andy Warhol cost one million seven hundred fifty thousand wow. dollars, which for a you know a period film it was non-union. That was my f for my first movie and my last non-union, and uh, because then I joined the guild, um, it was seven weeks, which was a ton of time. No kidding. Yeah. Well, back then uh. nothing seemed to cost anything. I mean, <laughs> I mean, mind you, it was a crew who took. El I had a genius DP, Ellen Chorus. Yes, I know you. Uh, just a remarkable bunch of people you found. Fantastic, yeah. but um, you know they were they were not. Pam not Koffler, your, not John Cale. Fan, yeah, yep. everybody was amazing. It wasn't the fastest crew in the world because they weren't <laughs> like one of the, you know you get a union crew or whatever here or in LA or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, but in, so it's the only time I've ever had time to kind of hang out in between scenes. Now it's bang bang bang. Um, so it was improvise. You know, uh, it, I let people improvise, and I don't usually. Um, what well, happened was know. I held a big uh, rehearsal, and my co-writer Daniel Minahan, uh, who's also a director, um, said, "Why don't you know get them all to come in character?" So we had a we really only had we had very, we had like three days of rehearsal, but I said, "Turn up at the at the set that we have. This all dressed as the factory, and come as your character, and just be your character." And we'll, for, for the whole evening, and, and we'll afternoon shoot you into and evening. And don't step out of character. Don't step out of character. And there were certain people like Michael Imperioli, you know, who later became famous in The Sopranos, who were just genius improvisers. And Lily's a great, Taylor's a great improviser. A lot of people doing great things. And then later when we were on set, I was trying to recapture that. And it's like, no, you can't. And, and, and I, I shot some stuff that really never worked because I was trying to sort of lightning in a bottle. And unless you set out to do a allow a lot of improv improvisation and shoot like that. Um, I thought I, you know, the continuity was all wrong. It was just very difficult to handle. So do you rehearse now and uh, other? I rehearse. Is it, I, I find it a tricky thing because sometimes if it's perfect, then they're sitting three weeks later on set going, what, what, what was it I did that was so great? So it's this act of memory rather than creation. And well, the thing is, I never, um, what I do more than rehearsing, uh, at the, for some reason, all of, the things I've done basically are centered or anchored around one big performance with a lot of very important characters. But, um, and starting with Lily Taylor, with Aisha Andy Warhol, I, I spent, because we had a long, long development process, we we're trying to raise funding. I would see her once a week and she would go through the script and we would talk about it and I would bring her research material. So I started that, um, which also you know, helps you bond and you, you, they ask you questions, you talk a lot. In American Psycho, because you know, we had a lot of issues, um, all movies get delayed and canceled for various reasons. Uh, Christian Bale was in LA and I, I was in New York and we would talk a lot on the phone and he would call up and say, you know, I've been working on it, this is what I, uh, these are my questions. And, and we, we talked about it and we developed a kind of philosophy of the character. Uh, I think on that one, I was saying to him, you know, think of yourself as a Martian, someone from Madison who's landed in America <laughs> and is, is, is pretending to be a human being and is watching everyone trying to learn what they do. Um, and indeed, I did this with Sarah Gadden on, on Alias Grace. You know, we would meet... Beforehand it, it, and just it, discuss it. A lot it in pre-production. She read all the scripts to me aloud. Ah, lovely. She would make me dinner. <laughs> and you would talk about it, and a uh, very good cook. And We're gonna um, cast that Sarah Gadden. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh. and so, to me, that's more important than the rehearsal. Although you know, I like to rehearse to get the actors to work together a bit. But I really, the really like yeah. talking it through. Then I'll rehearse, but I I I always shot list. But I I never I you know storyboarding is very hard for me. I would only do it for a, a visual effects sequence. If I had my it's way, hard for you. Why? I just don't see. I can't plan out shots like that. I, I if I had my way and a really, you know, lot of money to shoot with, I would do all my planning and blocking on location. Oh, that's the dream. Yeah. I really can't see a scene properly until I'm. You're there. Until I'm there. 
maybe that, I mean, that's probably just how my... Planning and blocking with the actors. With the actors. And the cinematographer there. And, and the then come back the next day and shoot it. Right? Yeah, because I like yeah. to see what also, to me, what's exciting is what the actors do with it. And I don't want to, you know, tell them that, you know, if they need to be standing, that they can't stand. And, you know, hopefully they're at the, it's a sort of situation where if you keep your, you're in the right direction for the lights, that you, you can uh, be flex somewhat flexible with the blocking. Mm -hmm. But I really can't see it until I've got them there. Mm -hmm. Then I really can, can see it. I can, I can have an overview of it, of how it should look, but not the, not the details. So do you come with, okay, it's gonna be all movement, or it's gonna be circular dolly, it's going to be just a tableau? Do you come with that? Or? Yes, I think with things like that, then, then um, and I do shot list because even if I, and I always say, I'm not gonna stick to it. And sometimes people get very angry about that. Just don't share them. Don't what? share the shot list. I know, no, no, <laughs> but it's always a DP kit. But you said, but we talked. Oh, the DP, no, you have to we share We planned them. that, it's yeah. like, no, well, I don't care. You know, whatever, <laughs> sorry. Um, which is sort of cavalier, but it's, it's almost like, but it's different, I've seen it, I've seen them do it now it, it, in the world. I mean, I think it's very important shot list because it makes you think through the scene in a way that you're just not going to unless you really are, and someone is making you and you sit down and you talk about where you're going to put the camera. And a lot of the time you'll, you'll stay with that or you'll say this is steady cam. you have to decide on that one or this is not or do we need a, a crane or are we just going to do this very um, more static and classic. Uh, so you talk to can that. You, can I just, I, I mean, yeah. I know it's instinctive and maybe it's not something you put words to, but how do you find what, where to put the camera um, and how to move it or not move it? Do you, like, I, I, it's that, purely instinctive. I really can't answer yeah. that. I mean, and also, you know, I, I, hopefully also you work with a great, a great DP. I mean, Brendan Stacey that we did Last Grace with was, was really great at, at doing, a, everybody has different, he's fantastic at doing a shot in one. There's a couple scenes on Alias Grace that we'd planned to do completely differently. Mm -hmm. There was one that was supposed to be at night um, and it, we decided to do it at twilight. It's about two people you know, sort of around laundry and it was this kind of, it's actually a sort of flashback or a, maybe a, f a memory uh, or a false memory. And we decided to shoot it at twilight, and, we, and because the light was fading, we had to do it in one. And he just get, got a fantastic, we, it's, it's almost saying, okay, let's do it now. Light's great, let's do it now. And hopefully you've got someone who will work with you. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, some of my very favorite things that we did in Alice Grace were, were catching the, the beautiful light when you have to kind of throw out your plan and do it that way. You can't do that, by the way, if you have a thousand extras and, and two cranes and everything. This is more about the more flexible. At our, at, at some, some do. <laughs> some do. <laughs> but I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think anyone would let me do that. You don't think what? I don't think anyone would let, let me, me uh, do that. Uh, you know, suddenly throw out the plan on a... I, sorry, I know this isn't about me, but I would, I, I'm so fascinated by how other directors make these decisions and... I dawned on me a little while ago that you look at the verbs <laughs> in the <laughs> scene. Maybe this is silly, but you know, reeling, make it real. Mm -hmm. um, fixed, you know, or stunned, make it stunned. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, does that sound hilariously simplistic to you? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, American Psycho had a, it was what when it come out two thousand. Was that it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it had a um, real rough ride at the mm -hmm. beginning, mm -hmm. um, and now it's quite respected, um, mm. and it sort of uh, stood the test of time, and I think, uh, mm. I, and I was w wondering, you know, I mean, there's bad behavior in it, um, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> mm -hmm. people tend to love that if there is a kind of a, um, punishment, mm. and you had no punishment, and you've said um, that it, what distinguishes this from genre is that there is no retribution or, um, or, or uh, punishment. Well, I think his punishment is being himself, and I think that there is a really dark social satire in American Psycho, 
It's both sort of has a, uh, it's like a black satire, um, as well as a sort of horror movie or a thriller. But it's not, it's not a procedural, it's not finding the killer and, and punishing him. And con comforting everyone that all, all is well with the world, order has been restored. Yeah, order is not restored. It isn't. Been and the whole and if if you if he was punished, order would be restored, as you say. And the whole point about it is that he's not punished because nobody cares enough to find him out, and he's like hiding in plain sight. If anybody put made real effort, and that's the sort of satire. I he's mean, begging to be punished by the end. He's at the that, end, that scene, he by the way, is shockingly fantastic. Oh, good, it's unbelievable thank you. Performance. Shot in Toronto, down the road. <laughs> um, he he wants at that point he wants to be caught because I, my feeling about him is, and I think this is absolutely in the book. Um, it's so funny because at the end of the book is it, he sees a, he's looking at a sign saying this is not an exit. I thought, well, we have to have this sign. This is not, and they, and they uh, on the day of shooting, this is the sort of thing that happens. So the art department turned up and said, this sign that was like this big, it was a bit like, you know, Spinal Tap when they, it's like, well, I can't put that sign up. No one's going to see it. And I read section, they said, but, you know, really, it, that would be too obvious. And I, yeah, you're right. It would, it would, you know, it's a literary device. But the spirit of it, uh, which I hope people get from it, is that this is not an exit. Like, him, him getting away with it is not an exit. He is in hell. He, a hell of his own making, and he is a, mo you know, a monster condemned. Yeah, I was struck by that. I guess when he says, she says, he, he's breaking up with Reese Witherspoon, mm. and then she said, "You're so heartless," and he said, "No, I'm very. What is it? I'm, I'm in touch with humanity." <laughs> and I don't, I can't remember exactly what you did, but it was, it was really pointed up, and I thought. That, that line mattered to you. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in a way, he's, yeah, well, but I mean, he's, in t he's trying to be a human, but he, he's not, you know. I mean, it's a monster movie, really. I mean, he is, <laughs> he's a deformed person. And, uh, I, you know, his punishment is to be himself. Unfortunately, he's punishing others, innocents, at the same time. So, but what makes it a satire? Because on some level, he's kind of sexy and suave. But and then he's then he pushes it over into dorky and and hopeless. That, well, that was um, why Christian's performance was so brilliant, and why I think I really, really wanted him to play it. And I had a big battle with it, uh, everyone over casting Christian, who was not famous at the time and mm. not a star, um, because he had a fantastic sense of humor about it. Mm. And which I have to say, the American actors who came in were, were much more earnest about it. And some people came in, and I think there was a feeling that basically Baton was kind of cool. And Christian was the one who thought that he was absurd and ridiculous, which is how I saw it. Because it is a satire on masculinity. And that's all, that is in the book. The, all the comedy of Baton's ridiculousness, the absurdity is in the book. Um, and I, that was a very important aspect. I'm not, I'm not making this a cool serial killer. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a ridiculous person, you know. And which I, <laughs> I love, just Christian did such great things. Like, and also we just said he's obsessive compulsive. So if you've seen this, he's like arranging things on the desk. Or when he's got the date with Chloe Sevigny and she puts a spoon down, he's like there with a, with a coaster. You know, I mean, he's, he's got these absurd OCD. quirks. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you say things. it's a masculinity in crisis. Would you? S so, is masculinity in crisis? <laughs> I don't, you'd have to ask, ask some men about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I know like, some. I'm sure. I, I like, um, and I like, I like shooting films about men. You know, I, I'm not just like, oh, I will only tell you know women's stories. I, there's definitely some 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 men's stories I'm interested in telling. I never, I never felt that in any way I should be restricted in, w in what I made films about. And when American Psycho came out, I, uh, you know, I was at Sundance and I was seven months pregnant and you know, I was actually, people did actually say, how can you, a mother, You're supposed this? to be nice all the time. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> I, never, I never felt, uh, it's not, I'm not, it's messing to Christ, I don't know, I mean, Obviously, the, when one group is, is grabbing for power, another group will feel threatened by it, and there'll be, fil they'll be hopefully, film, you know, people will make films about, how, men should make films about how they feel about that. I would not want to muzzle anyone. I think men should make, be as uncensored as they want. Just say, I'd rather know what people really think or what their imaginations are really about. I, I'm, not, I'm kind of very libertarian in that way. I want to hear what everybody thinks. That's, 
you know, we're not, we're making films. But you're not interested in the hero movie, and here is someone who's doing it fantastically well. Hey, hey, we'll Oh, I look. might. Oh, I have a project oh, really? like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not against that. I, I might do that. I might have a project like that. You might see something like I that. I haven't seen it. In the future, <laughs> maybe. That would you surprise know. me. <laughs> I, I don't think I'll do it. I don't really want to do a lot of, now, you see, if I say I don't want to do something, then I'll do it, so I'm not going to say what I wouldn't <laughs> do. Bit of a contrarian, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the acting in, in, in that movie and all of them is sort of startlingly uh, ambiguous and layered. Mm. Is there something, I mean, I, I, I think that's a definition of good acting, is that mm. there's, it's packed and there's so many things and we're mm. switching between, because I think that's what happens in our daily life. Is there something you can do? I, I resist this. I, sh you pulled out a good performance out of someone like it's some kind of an intestine or something. Like, mm. what, 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 what is it you do to create a, a world where that can happen? I, I, casting. Yeah. It's okay. really entirely casting. If you cast the right person, they will give a great performance. And if you cast the wrong person, they won't. And it doesn't matter. You can cast a really good actor and miscast them mm. in something they shouldn't do. Um, and, and film casting is very, very specific. And I constantly have very wonderful people come in that are not right for the role. And it's probably very disappointing to them if they don't get it. And you sort of want to say to all of them, no, you've got to understand, it's specific. Sometimes somebody comes in and physically like, oh, well, we'll go through this, but I just can't see you playing this. Um, it has to be, uh, I mean, when I cast Gretchen Maul as Betty Page, I originally wasn't even, I knew her and I admired her, but I, I, when my casting director suggested it, it's like, oh, Gretchen, but she's like completely physically wrong for this. Because she was blonde and slender and sort of had a 1930s look to her. Anyway, she came in and she was so brilliant. That was it. No one, after that, no one else mattered. You know, I had, and I had, uh, troops of Betty Page lookalikes coming in that I wasn't interested in because she caught that kind of innocence and sort of joyfulness, the joy in posing, like a, a little girl quality and, and at the same time a ladylike quality and yet being completely natural if she had to take her clothes off, you know. Mm. All these Betty, wonderful Betty qualities. Uh, you, you describe a situation where you're sitting there and famous actors are trotting in front of you. Is that, like, are you never at this, in, in a place where you're knocking at agents' doors and oh. saying, can you please get oh. the script to so-and-so? Yes, and constantly. And it never yeah. does? Yeah, always. And, and then sometimes, it's funny, you, you always start out with trying to get famous actors and sometimes, uh, and when they, sometimes when they say no, and I think back, I thought, oh, it's a good thing they said no. Mm. Because I, I actually, I was trying to get my film finance, but I, I didn't have the right person. So I often think when somebody says no, then it's just not meant to be, and you just move on. But yes, you're all, always waiting on people's... You, know, you might have your heart set on somebody. That definitely has happened to me. And then they say no, and then you just say, well, they're not meant to be. Okay. Um, so tell us about uh, the notorious Betty Page. Um, a 50s pinup model who becomes a porno star, helping popularize porn. Do you think she did a, a good thing, a useful thing to well, society? Well, she's not... You know, when we say porn, we're talking about 1950s right, okay. bondage 50s photos. Porn, yeah. You know? Yeah. And the whole thing about that, which was, I, I felt like, much misunderstood uh, when the film came out, and I was sort of accused of, like, turning a blind eye and sort of sanitizing. 1950s bondage photos are very... Well, these were very pretty innocent, really. I mean, some of the, some of the gear is heavy fetishism. But the thing about the photos that Betty did was there were never any men in the photos. And that is... She was knocking about other women. Or even in the films. Uh -huh. You know, but also they were kind of... La you could see them laughing. I mean, they're play fighting, really. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like... They were like, you know... And she, yeah, and, and they and don't actually make contact half no, the time. It's, it's so, funny. <laughs> it's such sort of... Inter inter and we, we actually tried to reprodu reproduce those films exactly with all their awkwardness. And it's funny, when I, I first got interested in Betty Page, my friend Sam Green, now famous documentary maker, uh, we were working on a, a TV show together. And he put a, um, this magazine, the Betty Pages, left it on my desk. It was a fan magazine about Betty Page. And I looked at these photos, and this was this girl in, in bond, a bondage outfit with a whip, smiling as if she's like holding a tray of cookies. 
and uh, like Betty Crocker. She is, yeah. And it, there's a lamp, and it's in somebody's like 1950 suburban living room. It's like, oh, this is so weird. And so, <laughs> how, who took these? This is so strange. Was uh, that the appeal? That that disconnect. That disconnect, yeah. and 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 the the fetishism and the cheerfulness, and so what's the story? And and I was very interested. I guess one thing I've always been very interested in, this is true of Alias Grace, it's true of all of them. I'm interested in, in a per, uh, person against their histor uh, uh, historical background. Shoot, I have to jump ahead. I'm very interested in this. But um, w just one quick question on Notorious Betty Page is that you, she had a history of uh, v pretty grave um, sexual abuse, mm -hmm. but you didn't want to portray that because you felt like you didn't want to have this sort of Oh, sexual abuse leads to well. She was molested activity? by her father, as was Valerie Solanas. Oh. Uh, and in both cases, we mention it early on. It's it's acknowledged or it's illustrated, uh, illustrated, it's suggested, um, but not dwelt on because um, it's funny because I started writing Betty Page before I shot Andy Warhol. In fact, or, or no, I was writing them sort of concurrently. So here are two very different women. One becomes a fetish pinup, or a, and and a sort of sexy pinup, and one becomes, he writes, the scum manifesto. They both, they both have sexual abuse, as did, you know, Anna Nicole, you know, I mean, they're, and they're all very, very different in, in what they end up doing. So it's not like it's not important, because, so you want to reference it, but the idea that uh, it's, it's a direct correlation uh, between, it, like, oh, so then she, I think, honestly, there's a whole element, I've talked to people, you know, in f fetish, you know, uh, where, at one point I was going to write a journalistic thing about the fetish, people who make fetish garments. And, and um, th there's, there's, some people do these things because it's really easy money and it's a cozy world, you know? It's a comforting world, it's a, um, uh, you know, People find companionship. People, there's a lot of complexity in it, and and to make it's it. It's the first time I heard fetishism and cozy in the well, same no, sentence. Well, no, no, but actually, <laughs> but actually, there is. Everyone gets sort of like, oh, well, it must be awful. It's a community like any other, mm -hmm. you know. I know that's I, when I was in London. This was back in the '80s, and um, a friend gave me this British fetish magazine, which was hilarious about rubber, the magazine of rubber and leather fetishism. So I went to talk to the people who made these costumes, and there was this lovely woman named Edna saying, "Hello." She says, "I, I wouldn't want. I, you know, I'd rather have a nice cashmere sweater and a tweed skirt, you know." But here they are, and, and a customer came in who was a, obviously like a, a lawyer or something. Who's is it ready yet? Wanting his, you know fetish gear. gear. And it's like, oh my God, this is so, if you were writing this, you would never write this world. Right. You would never write people sitting right. But it's the same thing with punk. You know, I was part of the punk rock world. And when people want to portray this, they always make it super decadent and crazy. And people are shooting up in the bathroom. Well, maybe they were shooting up in the bathroom. But a lot of, as I don't know English punk rock or American punk rock, a lot of times people just sitting around having tea, talking about tea, what's on TV. There's a normality about all these worlds that that is part of it. There are people creating communities. Uh, I could talk about that for a long time. Yeah, so anyway. But we so have to get to Alias Grace, to because Alias Grace, that is your new nothing to do with fetishism. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, You're, there's a murderess um, or murderer. Yes. What, how about that? Murderess versus murderer. Actress versus actor. Directorette versus director. Yeah, well, oh. there's, there's that great, there's that line, I'd rather be a murderess than a murderer. Um, well, it, in some ways, it's very, very interesting uh, doing a woman who, who, who may be a murderer um, because it's, uh, it's a much less common subject. And it's a, it's, by, by doing the story of Alias Grace, you're having to deal with a possible innocent victim. You know, there, there's different strands. So you're getting to... And for Sarah Gadden, she had to play... But multiple people in one, like multiple personalities in one performance. Mm. So you had the innocent version, you know, or there's the other scenario where she's extremely manipulative and the instigator of all this. So in one person, you get um, both every way you could see a woman almost. Mm. 
and and Sarah Polly had this wonderful thing that she was saying, and Sarah wrote it, and Sarah Polly who it. wrote it, and she yeah. had this wonderful thing, or adapted it, adapted it yeah. about how how women have a cr create almost like split personalities that women create multiple personality because they there is more pressure on women uh, to conform to expectations and i think all women to a greater or lesser extent certainly in in their growing up uh are learn to be one thing in one setting and and maybe mm. one thing in another well i have to say i when i was preparing for this mm. Thing we're doing. Um, I got the two episodes that they're going to be showing here at the festival, mm -hmm. and I uh, wrote back very authoritatively and said I have to see them all because I was so hooked. Mm -hmm. It's completely compelling. It's oh, very beautiful. <laughs> Extraordinary performance, Sarah and Edward. Mm. I mean, really beautifully yeah. done. Really, yeah. I just highly recommend this. It's, but there's that one moment you actually encapsulate what you're talking about, where she's talking about. Uh, um, Grace is talking about how she could be perceived. Yes. And she's, it's voiceover, and there's the most subtle transformations of every possible. She's, she's a bit of a dimwit now. She's a, a, a dastardly schemer. No, she's kind of accidentally, it, it, mm -hmm. and then it's, it's just fluid. It's really a kind of a little master class in acting right It was there. my favorite yeah. thing that we shot, and I, I would have, if I'd had my, my total final cut, I would have just shown the whole thing in one take, actually. Uh, um, cause it, and I, why couldn't you? Uh, well, because people wanted it, you know, I think you should just cut a little Tighten bit of it. it. Oh. Um, but yeah, it feels like one take, though. It feels, oh, good, it, it feels it like It feels that. very fluid, and yeah, it's... Uh, we, Sarah had to do it. We did single long takes of it. She had to do the whole thing in one, and a few times, because uh, we shot several different sizes. And then what we did was we played the voice, her voiceover over it as she looked in the mirror, and then she, she performed that. Uh, and it was just, and I knew she could do these magical shifts. Uh, and it was even better than even that I'd she imagined. She looked in the mirror as she was doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And they were just, to me, magical. Um, to watch these different graces, like just like rippling over her it's face. It's like what? It's like a sort of clouds shifting over in a, on yeah, the landscape. Yeah, yeah. So, so my single favorite thing that she did was that. I mean, there's lots of great things actually. <laughs> I, I love the hypnotism too, but I, I just love that moment. You like what did you say? Oh, the hypnotism, but we don't want to get the plot away. <laughs> yeah. um, did you start with a? You know, like I'm, all, I'm, I'm very interested in the um, germinating idea of a of a director's vision on something. Is it mm. was it a feeling? Was it an image? Was it a piece of music? Was it a um, mm. color? Like what? Do, do you remember how you started? Was it just something? No. Um, I'm. I mean, I'm very interested. You know, I had a lot of images on my wall. Uh, and in early, I went when I was um, I was in London, and they had an exhibition of these photographs with Julia Margaret Cameron, who's an oh, early sure, 19th yeah. century photographer. And I was really, really taken with these photos, even though it's, uh, they're later than this, obviously, because it's photographs. Um, uh, and there's uh, and she's fantastic because they're sort of out, a lot of them were kind of out of focus, which kind of shocked people at the time. But they're so beautiful, and and that be them being slightly out of fo the focus being. A lot makes them very modern and very real, and you really feel like you're looking at someone now. And I, I can't explain how they fit into this, but I was very taken, and there are a lot of portraits of women. Uh, and I had big blow-ups of them on my wall. Mm. Uh, and it's funny, because, um, yeah, and then our, at one point our production designer was in my office and looking at these big photographs, and there's a couple of the same woman, actually Virginia Woolf's, Aunt or something looks like, and doing different in different expressions. Says, "Oh, is that how you're going to do that scene?" I was like, "Oh, you know, oh yeah, just a big close up." <laughs> and and I hadn't really worked Which out how scene? to do the scene. scene? The, the scene of her of her doing that monologue and about all the different graces. Oh, I see. Wow. Says, so, so, "Oh, yeah, you just do it in the in the mirror, you know, the, in a close up, and you'll." Watch her face shifting. So you could have just done it all out of focus, too. Yeah, I mean, that would have, <laughs> <laughs> we would have loved that. Um, so those photographs, and then some landscape. Um, I don't know. 
How did you work with uh, Sarah Polly on the on the whole project? Uh, the amazing Sarah Polly. Sarah amazing Sarah Polly. Well, we we had a whole session on the scripts. Um, now I can't even remember what changes were made. They, I, th you know, just changes were made on this on, on the script. Or this? In pre, in, before we started pre-production, just the, the, there was because what I I had not read the novel, which then I did read it. In pre it's now my favorite Margaret Atwood novel. But I thought one of us has not has to have not read the novel. So there were certain things I got her to take out because it would turn out they were from important important story, you know, subplots within the novel that, it, anyway, see, this is about Edward and Grace, and this is about Grace's memories and what happened in the farmhouse, and just we need to kind of focus it more on that. And there was a lot actually more about Edward back home, but it was like, no, let's, it's, it's about the two of them. And then when you read the novel afterwards, did it sort of change? Did you, oh, so when, like, when did oh you, yes, like, oh, that's just really good, but, but it, 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 I think... You read it before you made the show, though. Yeah, yeah while yeah. we were in, in yeah. prep. Yeah. And then? Uh, well, you know, there's certain things, oh, I see, I see more about why she wanted this and that. But it's still, I think my initial instinct was right to have to judge it as just yeah. as, as scripts. Do, do you feel like there's a, uh, a comparison with Handmaid's Tale or a, it's in the antithesis or it's irrelevant? I mean, it will be discussed in, in the press, yeah. but it, that doesn't always matter. Well, I'm, I'm going to quote Sarah Paul again because we were just all doing press together and she said a great thing, which is that... Um, Ailis Grace is about where we were, where we've come from. Mm -hmm. Hammy's Tale is where we could be headed, uh. and we're where we are now, you know, in process. And it's sort of, Hammy's Tale more like a warning. And to me, Alias Grace is a, a wake-up call in the sense that this is what our past was really like. This is what it was like in Canada in the 19th century. It was shocking to me, because my family came over, my father's family anyway, on those boats, because we got these horrible, like, the, the Atlantic Passage. And it was extremely class-ridden, uh, brutal. The prisons were absolutely brutal. I was shocked. When we went to the museum at Kingston Penitentiary, and I saw the size of the cell, they have, they have a, a reproduction of, and the cell you see in the film, which looks so tiny, it's actually bigger than the actual. They lived in something the size of a mattress. And the rules were psychotic. So, you know, the, the that rules was this about, is, about okay. you know, well, if, you, if you talk during, uh, speak during uh, a mealtime, you'll be whipped. Right. Um, so it and was how, a... How do you feel like her treatment would have been differently, different if she'd had been a man? You know, actually in prison, not much better. Okay. But I think that w where her treatment would, would, would have, was very different was that women then were, especially you know, working class women then were sexual prey to everyone. Servant girls... But no longer. Well, um, <laughs> well, they still are, but they could actually have birth control. Sorry. And and getting pregnant does not. If you get pregnant now, you don't necessarily have to drown no. yourself in the river. Right. <laughs> Although some people will. Depending what country you're in. Depending. But yes. what, well, actually, there are countries where you would drown yourself yeah, exactly. in the river, or you'd, your family would drown you. But but it, the virgin also it was also the fetishization of virginity. So the the virginity and what actually Margaret Atwood recommended a book to me, which I wish I could remember the name of it. Was the account of a woman of the 19th century traveling around Canada who had sort of feminine interests and she said that basically there was like 20 something astonishing like 20 percent of, of of young women um where it would would end up this way on the streets or dead 20 percent because in order to preserve the virginity of upper class women oh. because uh, you know middle uh, upper, middle class and upper class men would become engaged, and they had to preserve the sanctity of their betrothed women, uh, but they right. wanted to have sex. So the, who would they have sex with? They would have, se have sex with the servant girls ones. or farm yeah. girls who were disposable, who, who, who would take the punishment if they got pregnant. Right. And so these girls were sexual fodder and disposable. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what a lot of this uh, alias grace is about. Right. Um, I'd love to open it up to the audience if anyone has a question here. Can you just please wait for the um, microphone? Mm -hmm. Here we've got, oh, someone beat you mm -hmm. with the microphone. Go ahead. 
Hi, um, I watched the industry screening of Alias Grace yesterday mm -hmm. and was blown away. It's beautiful, so congratulations. Uh -huh. um, I just was curious about the conversations you had with Sarah Gadden before you started. Like, I'm curious how you um, both got into the scenes, especially, I think you talked a little bit about the emotions playing on her face, mm -hmm. but through the whole thing, I'm just w wondering about that. Did you do, well, the, well, I mean, did it's, you do it's, the lines for her? What? <laughs> did you do the lines for her? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah no, okay. no. Oh, I, you know, it's funny because one of the things as we were talking through it was, was our sense of mystery about her. Because sometimes you think you know her and then you come to something that she does. It's like, well, maybe she is guilty, you know? I, I was guessing all the way through. Yeah, it's like, like, really? Yeah. Grace, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? Because it's a real story, too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there's elements of the real story in there. That, so it has all the... Which I actually love about real-life stories, even if they're hard to do, is that they're... This is like, what? That makes no sense. Who would, who would think it, you know? But reality so is always more interesting, yeah. Yeah, so we, were, we would just talk about the, the contradictions. And then certain things about uh, Grace is quite puritanical. And um, it's funny because she's accused of murder, but she's she's quite prim, and she's you know she's been in asylum and in prison, and but she you know she, she's this contradiction. She's Northern Irish Puritan in many ways, or Northern Irish Protestant. Uh, at the same time, we we love her. You know, we love Grace. Completely compelling, throughout. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Here's another question. Oh, Hi. sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, I'm also a director. I'm a lover of your films and Patricia's films. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you know, one of the challenges as a director is obviously you can't shoot chronologically and you have to follow mm. the arc of a character. And as you said, it's casting more than directing to, yeah. to make a performance. You cast the right person, but at the same time there's... And, you know, some amazing actors can yeah, do incredible notes and know exactly where they're supposed to be at any given time, but... Do you find when you get into the editing room or the challenge of following the arc mm -hmm. of a character and their emotional state, do you find sometimes, oh, I fucked up, I sh I, she should have been there or there. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah, all the time. All the time. And, and how, how do you, like, also because you said it's not just casting, as a director, choosing the times when you step in, like do you, on a performance, like, even big, you know, often big actors don't really want to be directed or you are their mm -hmm. trusting person. But how do you deal with actors who, how do you speak to actors if they're off the rails in terms of how you feel the arc should be? Well, it's funny. there's certain things I say, um, the biggest, the most consistent direction I give is do it faster. Um, do it faster. Do it faster. I'm because... And then in editing, they, they speed it up, and then in editing, you're still saying do it faster. Yeah, right? do it faster. Like, but um, <laughs> also, I, it also helps because I think everybody's, everybody on a film set wants to do the very best they can. They want to give 110%. So usually, you know, the set decorator will over-decorate, and the costume decorator will over 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 ornament yeah. <laughs> and um, and actors can overact or they can just do to which is not true of Sarah Gadden and Edward Holcroft who I think are you know that's not true of you I think they're here somewhere. who are here <laughs> or maybe they're not or or they are. <laughs> or, or uh, <laughs> Karen not true of you but they um you know uh, people will drag things out and everyone's better when they it, it's very hard for an actor I think to judge their pacing I said this to Christian also with when someone's doing an accent they um, slow down yeah, they slow down because they're trying to get the accent right. They're watching themselves. And so with Christian, that, that was almost my only direction, but I said it constantly, pace it up, pace it up, do it faster. I, and Sarah Paul said, oh, you can Which say that to... Which feels terrible as a director, right? To say, it feels terrible as a director to say that. I am, Don't you, I oh, am I ruthless. I am sorry. I am ruthless faster, about faster, it. Just, just pace <laughs> it up faster, smaller, get on with it, you know? Because really? You say those words? Um, sometimes, oh, I, do, oh. I say faster and do it smaller, yeah. Mm. And, and it's like, well, we're here to get something good. She does? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's but it's like we all want to make it great, right? And we're all in the same we're all in the same boat here. And it's like if you're the director, you're just the leader of the orchestra. Everyone else does every job better than I could possibly do it. I could not design a film. I could not act. I could not do any of these jobs. 
And the only thing that I'm there for and that I'm any good at, it really, is, to, is the tone, is, is, to, is to be in charge of, to keep the whole thing in my head, as you do, you know, the whole thing in my head, and to know what the final thing could be. Because everybody else who's doing their job so brilliantly, they have to do their particular job, and, and they shouldn't think about the overview. But sometimes you need to, to tone everything down. That's om almost like what always has to happen. Sarah, is this obnoxious? Would you just talk about what it is to work with this woman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm here to take over your Q and A. Yeah, yes, please yeah. <laughs> take it over. Uh, Mary is one of the smartest people I've ever met. She's a true intellectual. She's highly creative, and she's very honest. <clears throat> and if you need to pace up a scene, she will just not dance around that and just come up to you and tell you. And she doesn't bombard you with direction. She just says very focused, simple adjustments. Um, but, you know, we did spend so much time together in mm. pre-production. We spent a lot of time together, so much time together, to the point where I knew when Mary was hungry. I still know when <laughs> she's still hungry. Know. Which you knew is pretty Mary much was all what? the time, I knew actually. when Mary was hungry. <laughs> I still she hungry now? Is she yeah. hungry now? Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Always hungry. Um, Edward, do you want to talk to it a little bit? No? She just said faster, faster, faster. Faster, <laughs> that's all she said. That was her whole thing. Excellent. Faster. <laughs> Come on. And hands off your face. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yes. Yeah. Actually, sit on your hands. Hands off hands your face. Sit on your hands. Yeah, hands yeah. Hands off your face. <laughs> and right. care? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, no, he doesn't want to. Okay, don't don't force him. So I think I think that what everybody wants, because I think we all start from that we're we're you know a team, we're collaborators, and no one is be one to be dictatorial. Um, I need to know also when things something going is going wrong, you know, or I'm taking too long on something, and I think as the producers will tell me, and I think that it's faster and more efficient and helps everybody if you're not dancing around it. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, but I, th this speed thing, I think, is partly because when you're in the room hmm. doing this, you're all so amazed that you've got, you know, the money and the people and it, hmm. and you're not quite as focused sometimes as the people sitting at home watching. Hmm. They're doing nothing else and you're doing a thousand, you're balancing a thousand things. And I think that we, you know, underestimate the kind of visual literacy of the audience mm. when we're in that moment and later when we're in the editing room we're like what was I thinking I yeah, so, you have to say so, sometimes if, when I've fallen too in love this is also the product of experience of, of falling too in love with things mm -hmm. you know and then like oh that doesn't work as some and also some things work fantastically on set and the crew and everybody loves them because they're quite often they're things that are quite big and theatrical and then you get them in and it's like uh oh you know take it down the, uh, but we do try, and I think, you know, that was one of the things that we had to do in, in these long scenes with, it, with Grace. Uh, it's also true of care in your scenes with Grace, that where there's an ambiguity about who's guilty, who's not, that we, we, had, we did um, a series of takes always that we, where Grace would do me different versions of her. Of her oh. What we call bad Grace, good Grace, neutral Grace. Um, were the, were and, the, and those that, were the three graces? Yeah, those are the three main graces. And then that Edward or Karen would have to minute. respond to that. What, to what, what should we do with this one minute, people? We have one minute. Does anyone have a really beautiful question? It's too much pressure. Too much yeah. pressure. Okay, okay, a stupid question then? Wait. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, Mary, if you haven't seen the new Grace Jones documentary, um, oh, I will see it. <laughs> yeah, it's really <laughs> fantastic. Alias so Grace Jones. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a boring question, but I'm sure your answer won't be boring. What filmmakers have inspired you and continue to inspire you? Good question. Great. I mean, I have to say they are men because I think that you are mostly influenced by the people you see as a teenager. I was very influenced by certain films. Um, uh, I loved Hitchcock when I was a kid. Uh, I loved Bunuel. Um, I love um, Kubrick. Uh, and then I loved uh, a film called, well, Night of the Hunter. It was very affected me, and I always think of about Night of the Hunter. Uh, also because there are certain films I love. I love a lot of noir. Um, 
And I love kind of neglected films, you know, and, and like of which Night of the Hunt, Night, which was a total failure. It's a masterpiece. Charles Lawton directed it. See if you haven't seen it. Night of the Hunter. Night of the Hunter. It's not neglected. No, I mean, no, it's, oh, oh, no oh, but it's, it was then. No, okay. it's Charles Lawton yeah. directed it, and he never made another film because it was a failure, right. total failure. But it's a, a beautiful sort of gothic masterpiece. So, uh, yeah. I, and it never dawned on you that they were men. Right? You just, those were, were the movies. films you liked. Those they're were movies, just films. They're movies I like. And, and, you know, obviously, you know. Did you see at, at a certain point a film by a woman and you felt I affirmed love swept by it? I love Swept Away, actually. Yeah. Lena Wertmo, I guess, was, I mean, I, I honestly, I would say this, but the only woman, I, person, I, woman filmmaker I knew when I was growing up was Lena Wertmo. Mm. Uh, was um, um, Lenny, Lenny Riefenstahl. Riefenstahl, yeah. Yeah, Lenny. so. Great. When I grew Shocking. up, I could be Lenny Riefenstahl. Um, <laughs> But I didn't think of being a filmmaker. I, I thought I would write. I, I did not know any women directors. So Although there were a few, but I did not know that the women... That it was I just, possible. I just thought I would be, maybe be a screenwriter. Right. I did think about, about uh, trying to get into film, but it never occurred to me that I could direct. I thought it was a very technical job that I would not be any good at. Well, thank the heavens and thank the progress of society <laughs> that you did become a director and... Yeah. A writer, and thank you very much, audience, and Mary Heron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Heron.